I guess, well, God gave me a title this morning, so I'll start with the title, and then I'll just tell the story and see if it, how God makes it fit into it. But the title of today's message is The Summary. And basically, we're talking, we've been doing, a, a, this is still the final message to an honorable stand. Um, and I'm going to summarize. So just as a warning, I will ask people to share something brief, a sentence that they got out of this series, because I don't just want it to be another series that goes bye-bye, and then people didn't take from it everything they were supposed to take. You know what I mean? I want to know that there's fruit in your life as a result of an honorable stand. And what you just shared, Sherry, is that's fruit of it. That's what it is. Honorable stand is that, letting the faith precede you and let it stay in front of you no matter what. You know, my favorite scripture in Deuteronomy 28 is all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. That's the same as proceeding, um, where the blessings catch up to you and then get out ahead of you. You hear what I'm saying today? There's a place that you come to where the blessings, you know, there's people that live their life in pursuit of blessings. And there are Christians that never get past living in the pursuit of blessings. But there's, the, when Deuteronomy 28 says the blessing will come on you and then get in front of you, that means they precede you. You just walk into them. God called me into something that, let me just lay it, let me just paint this picture. See if I can get some of us there. Especially some of us who've been playing with our dreams for a while and not really pursuing them. You set forward to do something God has called you to do. You don't see the opportunity or the means for it to happen, even though God has shown his hand in it and proven that he's in it. Your, your natural faith or curiosity is not being satisfied. Hmm? Am I speaking, am I speaking good English here? So you get discouraged and disappointed. And you go take a job. Work that job for 30 years so that you can have a good retirement and have all your medical benefits and all that kind of stuff. Now, I want to talk about the two words that I just said. Discourage, disappointment. If you take the diss off of both of those words, they're powerful words. Courage and appointment. See, see, the, every word that has diss in front of it, if you move that diss in front of it, this is what I'm about to say, the root word exists. Hmm, let me, let me say it like this. The natural order exists. How many of you say love courage? Yeah. Love an appointment. Yeah. Yes. So we've given so much power to the added word, this, that we threw the rest of it away. So the opposite of courage is to be discouraged. So then you decide to have courage and believe in the face of the dis. You're getting that? Because it's just three letters trying to blot out a powerful root word. Somebody say, I am encouraged. See, that's the thing. But the root word still is courage. So we go ahead and we take these jobs and we get moved out of courage, discouraged, or disappointment, meaning we lose sight of our appointment. God has given us an appointment, and we put this on it. And disappointment is, in simple terms, this. You went on the calendar that God gave you, and on the appointment, 
you put cancel. See, there's a, there's, if everybody's t that's techno technology savvy now, you know, you get these appointments that come from your Google counter, calendar, and you have attending, yes, no, what's the other one? That's what most Christians check. And it stays maybe for decades, years. And here's what's sad, funny, interesting, whatever word you want to throw on that. You go back to God crying about your destiny and why it's not manifesting. And then you want to tell God, I don't know nobody. I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't, and, and God says, okay, then do what you do. And then you do that, and then you become discouraged in the thing that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing anyway. And you back, go back to God, and you ask God for wisdom, and God says, uh, remember the thing I told you three years ago before you took that job? Go do that. And then you give God the same story, but I don't know nobody, and I don't have connections, and I don't know where to go, and I don't know what to do, and, and you check maybe again. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, a lot of people listening. Right? And you go back to maybe. And God says, okay, I'll work with you maybe. I still love you. I'm get you a new job. I got three promotions in a week. Were you so happy? And you come to find out that you're motivated by cookies and not by vision. Hmm. Somebody said you're messing with me now. <laughs> you're motivated by cookies, trinkets, rewards, shiny things. but not vision. After a while, the shiny things don't shine anymore. Your eye got used to the shine and you come to realize that the shine is still not the thing God spoke over you. It's not your purpose in life, it's just the thing you do. And I wanna say something to you saints and saintettes. <laughs> the challenge in life is living out your destiny not surviving. Am I speaking to somebody this morning? That's the challenge. This is the biggest challenge. So you, you get discouraged again and you go back to God again and you pray again. And God just has this irritating way of bringing up the same thing that he told you 10 years ago. <laughs> Just this era. Okay, okay, God, I understand that. And you're right, right? Come on. See, you're, 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 you're all smirking and looking around. And you say, God, I know you're right. Hallelujah. Amen. That's true, Lord. I know. I, I know. I know. But right now, I just need to pay this bill. I just need to do this. Can we, can we just work? On, and God is like, if you did what I told you to do, you'd be paying those bills. but I didn't know any people, and, and the line goes dead again. Because your heart's not right. Your spirit's not right. You're still trying to meet God on your conditions. You're not trying to find out where you need to be with God to see his manifestations. Come on, this is what I've been preaching for the past month. You, you ask and you, you, you have not because you ask not. You ask and you receive not because you ask a mist. You ask cloudy. You ask foggy. You ask with no clear direction. You ask with no clear appointment. You ask with no clear courage. You just throw wishful thinking up in the air and hoping that if you say in the name of Jesus, it makes a lie the truth. God knows you don't believe it. Well, how do I get to believe it? Get before God until you believe it. Don't move until your heart has changed. I will not let you pass until you bless me, Jacob said. 
Change my heart. Change my mind. Change my point of view. I will not leave your presence until I leave your presence with my disposition changed. But no, that's not what we want to say. I will not leave God until you give me that raise. I didn't call you for a raise. I said you should be the head and not the tail. I will not move into my position, my thought, my heart is changed about you and what you've called me to. I will not move until I'm a different person. I will not leave your presence until my heart becomes what you've called me to. And I think like you and I understand what you've called me to. I will not leave your presence, not until I feel good, until I know clearly what I'm in front of you for. So, God began speaking to me. You know what I love about God? He's a God of fragments. Gather up the fragments that nothing be wasted. Now, there's little things that God let you go ahead and do and different jobs he let you go ahead and take and different things you went and went to study that had nothing to do with, in your mind with what God was doing because you're running away from that thing that God called you to because you're trying to do these other things because after all, I got to pay the bill. And then you come to find out years and years down the road that God took all them little things that you did in your side journey to use toward what he's actually called you to. He let you take the long way around. But if you pay attention, there's stuff all in that. Oh, am I speaking to you this morning? There's stuff in there. He gathers up the fragment that nothing be wasted. Now, I got to say this to you because that, just, to, just to deal with that story, if you don't know where it came from, that's when he fed the multitudes with two fish and five loaves of bread, and he fed over 20,000 people. Now, I usually get into this little short conversation with pastors because I always shut them down because I'm good like that. Like, don't, don't deal with me with, with, with particulars when you don't have real facts. The Bible says it was 5,000 people. It does not. It said 5,000 men plus women children. Now, 20,000 is a nice number because they didn't have two kids, a wife and a dog back then. They had 10 and 15 kids each. So I'm just being nice saying one man, a wife, and two kids. That's 20 grand right there. All right, so 20,000 people with, fed with two fish and five loaves of bread. Then it gets crazier. I don't know why church people don't freak out on that alone, because that's a freak out moment. But then after they finish eating, Jesus, who can just create that stuff all over again, water into wine and bread and fish, he says to his disciples, gather up the fragments that nothing be wasted. And they gathered up 12 baskets full. But wait a minute, how did you take something distribute it, and then at the end, gather up more than you started with. Sound like my God. Wait a minute. I saw what you started with, and then you blessed it, and then you distributed it, and then you gathered up 12 baskets. Now, I've shared this many times, but there's people who haven't heard this before. So for those of you who know it, you can just smile. And those who haven't, I'm going to awaken you to something. Whatever basket you got in your head, lose it. Because they didn't carry picnic baskets, you know, with a sandwich and a couple of sandwiches and a bottle of wine. But that's not the description of a basket. How do I know? Because I research. I study. I looked up baskets and what that word meant in the original language. And here's what I saw. They stand about this tall. They're big enough to hide a person in. And they're straw. And the people, when they went to market, they carried this basket on the shoulder. That was their shopping cart. Um, how many of you saw Indiana Jones? Remember they had the girl in the basket running around, Indy! And she's running back. And he's trying to find. Remember how big that basket was? That they could hide a woman in it? That was the baskets that they filled. 12 of, 12 people fit in baskets, starting with two fish and five loaves of bread. Watch this. That, that, that's, not the, that's not the meat of the point I'm trying to get. Off of the fragments left of what people picked or ate out of. Basically garbage. You didn't get it. 
I don't want to eat the scraps after everybody ate. That's the scraps. He said, grab up the fat with the food that's left. This is the leftovers. And out of the leftovers, more than what he started out with to feed the people was left. So people went back home not worrying about hunger at all. Once there was a move of God, people went back home. Not where, remember, see, you got to catch the story because the disciples said it's getting late. Should we send them home? See, all of this stuff is part of the story. And Jesus's response was that of a God response of the heart of a father, the heart of a provider. He said, should I send them home hungry lest they faint? Bring me what we got. Let me provide for them. So Jesus had a concern. I'm not going to send you back with nothing. You might not be able to stand. You might lose hope and become discouraged. If I send you home with an empty belly. But then you got the people like Saul who refused to be encouraged. See, you, you, you got to look. Come on now. You got to look at the levels. He decided to feel sorry for himself and he would not be. David could come play the harp for him and all kinds. Of, and he would have this temporary cessation of pain just to go back to it because that was what he knew. Misery it was his friend. He had a covenant. With misery and self-pity. Discouragement. The three-letter word that you decided to put in front of courage. To nullify God's purpose in your life. I'm talking to you today. Now. Years and years of doing that. But God would begin to lead me. Learn this. Learn that. Study this. Get better at that. Well, okay. Well, see, it's a little easier for me than some people. It's a little easier. I, and, I have, and, I, and I have to accept that. I took the big stands and, and stood in faith and believed my God and stepped out into things I didn't know. And from business to real estate and everything else. And, and developed for myself a nice little nest egg that I don't worry about paying bills and how I'm going to eat. Could eat a little less. So it's a different challenge for me because I'm not trying to figure out how I'm going to eat. But neither are some of you. You got your decent job. But instead of using your decent job as a support to go after the division that got the division in the appointment that God has given you, you're using that to wait it out. Then when you get fired, then you get serious and spiritual again. Hmm, the smiles went serious right there. Right now, now you're ready. Oh, I need Jesus so bad. Pray for me. Uh. Stand with me, fast with me. Do, do you know anybody? Well, why couldn't you do that while you had the job? Why don't you have everybody standing and praying and fasting for you for your vision when everything was still good? Now you're serious. Now you want to pray. Hmm. Hmm. And the people said. Amen. So I had a sense in my spirit about a year ago that I was coming to a place that if I didn't step into what God was calling me to, my wells were going to begin to dry up. I felt it. I felt it. Some of you all feel it, but you ignore it, and then it hits you, then you understand it's real. But I felt it. I know with all the good I did to provide for my family and leave my wife an inheritance and all this stuff, I could feel in the realm of the spirit. Come on, somebody pay attention to what I'm saying. I could feel in the realm of the spirit that judgment was coming. 
Not because I wasn't sinning and cussing God and chasing women and getting drunk and falling down steps. No, I just felt like you have made your provision, God. And if you don't check it, it will be moved. You know, your job is God now. I got benefits and stuff. I got full medical and dental. And, hmm, this is a good job, okay. Am I talking to people? I ain't pursuing nothing no more. I still talk about it. Finally think about it. Some people even get bold enough to say, you know, back when I was young and dumb, I had that dream, but you know, you know, I got a big, I got a job now. So God's vision for you was dumb, huh? It was for young, stupid people, huh? Hmm. Imagine what that says to God. He put this vision and dream in you, and you've decided that this city job you got is the real thing, and God's vision for your life is stupidness. Dumb stuff that you did and dreamed about when you were young and dumb and let the world talk you. Come on. I know I'm talking to somebody up in this place. So I went to God and said, God, what am I supposed to do with this group? What am I supposed to do with this music? I, and God kept saying to me, I told you what to do. Ten years ago. I'm doing all the social media posting and all the stuff I'm trying to do and, and nothing is happening. God, I don't understand this. I'm doing all the stuff. I'm watching the videos and taking the how to promote yourself on social media class and nothing. God said, I never told you to do that crap. What I gave you to do was before all this stuff was even powerful and alive. Look for movie and television placements and commercials for your stuff. You did it once in your life. I had you do it one long, long time ago, over 20 plus years ago, one time and ridiculous money for something that was 30 seconds long. But I decided, but I don't know nobody there, so let me go back to doing it the hard, long, drawn out way that people do it. Because I told you what to do. And Repeatedly, every time I go before God and say, what do I do now? He would repeat the same thing. And I say, amen. I'm going to do that as soon as I finish doing this. <laughs> I know you're right, Jesus. And that's, you know what? I'm going to get this set up. I'm going to get this established. I'm going to get this in place. I'm going to get this going and get this thing happening. And then I'm going to I'm gonna do that. Anybody there with me right now? Just one person? Anybody there with me right now? Okay, so, so, so I'm speaking the right word today, huh? Okay, that's the whole house. I'm, I'm speaking the right word today, right? I'm going to keep putting you off, God, while I ask you to bless the thing that you didn't anoint me to do. Bless my job. Make my boss like me. Make them give me a raise. I didn't call you to be here. I didn't call you to be here. I covered you. I provided for you in your disobedience. I showed grace and mercy for you, made sure you were able to usually barely pay your bills. Is this, is, this a, is this an ouchy kind of message? The Lord still heals. You'll be okay. <laughs> so, went back to him weeks ago. I said, what am I supposed to do? And he brought the same thing back up again. I said, you know what? It's time for me to stop being stupid. You may not like the word stupid. Maybe foolish works better for you. Or dumb. Or idiotic. <laughs> the word used in Proverbs chapter 1 is idiot. It says fool or foolish. Idiot. How long will you be a fool? When will you heed wisdom and direction and stop being a fool? <laughs> right? 
God is saying, I need you to catch this because we take that light. There's a place where he says, it is said, Jesus says in the New Testament, thou shalt not kill. But I'm saying to you, if you should say to your brother, Raka, as if to say thou fool, you should be in danger of hellfire. He didn't say you're going to hell. He said, but you get close. Just for calling somebody a fool. You know you call people worse. So let's, okay. But when you look at the meaning of the word fool, it's like a useless Life not deserving idiot. Like, why are you even breathing up the oxygen? Just die already. So when God is saying now in the Proverbs, you fool, how long will you be on the outside? You worthless, life, oxygen wasting jerk. How long before you receive wisdom and direction from me? Well, thank God for his grace and mercy because a lot of us have been fools. Now, God speaks it to me again. And this time I go, exactly what you said, Sherry. I don't know anybody there. But I know you do. I don't know the doorway but I know you do. So I begin reaching out to people that I know have those kind of relationships. And what I begin to get from everybody I know who was connected and had those kind of deals happening for them, the Oh Hey Love commercial, no, my brother, you got to get your own. Because I'm asking them to introduce their competition. Like, mm -mm, I'm not connecting you to my people. You might take food out. You take my work. You got to build your own relationships. I'll tell you what I did. I'll tell you how I did it. I'm not going to tell you who I did it with, but I'll tell you everything else you want to know. But to me, that was valuable. It was a start. So I sat down. I began to listen and take notes and pray from the, from, from, the place of, are you listening to me? You sure? Appreciating wisdom. <laughs> Appreciating wisdom. You smiling because God already did speaking to you, right? But some of you are still not getting it. See, God will give you a word and you, you will look at God like, okay, so, but where's the, where's the manifestation though? God said, you don't get a manifestation if you don't appreciate my word. Everything comes from my word. If, if you're going through something, I say, be encouraged. You go, yeah, God, I know, I know, but I got these bills to pay. Really? That's your response to me? I'm not moving another step for you. You don't deserve it. You don't honor or appreciate wisdom. You just disrespected God and the Godhead. You just respected Jesus. Jesus, the wisdom of God, and the righteousness of God, and the wisdom of God, and the power of God. You, when you spit at wisdom, you spit at the Savior. I'm giving you counsel from the most high throne, and your response is, but where's my rent money? Really? That's it? That's the best he gets? That you've been given access and, 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 and favor and, and position and disposition in Christ Jesus. Wherein you can call the creator of the universe, Abba, Father, and get his counsel. And the best you got is, but where's my earthly thing? So what's the difference between you and Saul? Not Saul who turned to Paul. Saul, the king that God despised and later repented that he even called. If all you can see is the stuff in the manifestation, but not the root of it all, which is in him all things were made. and Without him, not a thing that exists was made or not made, but everything was made through him. The wisdom of God, the power of God, the word of God, the spoken word of God is more powerful than any physical manifestation you can have, but all you can see 
is the lack of manifestation. It's insulting. You saw it in the wilderness when they murmured against the Lord. You saw it. You saw it. You saw the outcome. You saw it in when he said, wave it like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. Let not that person, let not that person, now he said, believe he will receive anything. Wishy-washy. Now, let's, let's just deal with this. I believe myself to be a strong stander and a strong believer. I pursue with gumption. I pursue with fire. But there's an area in my life that was disobedient, though. So I don't think I'm a man that has a problem believing God's word. But I think I had a problem with prioritizing it. That spoke to somebody. What place does God's word have? Is it something that's coming someday, maybe in the Lord's time? You know, and that's my excuse to not be obedient in this season. How many of you are privileged and honored to know that you can even hear from God? then shouldn't we treat that counsel with the utmost respect? Even over the bills facing us or the, the, the threats facing us or the, or the promises facing us, shouldn't that take priority over everything else? Well, for me, I realized it didn't because I kept putting off. Not saying no, I'm not going to ever disrespect God and say no. But I will ask him to wait, take a number. <laughs> Just me, though, right? No. Okay. I, I, okay. I don't want to be sure about that. Some of you are thinking about things right now that you've been telling God to take a number for so long, you're surprised he's still sitting in the waiting room. I don't care if you don't know somebody. What you said, you know God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You go forward as if when you pray, believe you received and begin to act like you received and begin to go forward with it. Now, I'm not talking about that stupid stuff where people say, I just claim in this house in the name of Jesus and, and, and going up to the house and claiming it. And you ain't done anything to look into what it costs or anything on your part that. God would have led you to do. You just think you, it's a magic word now. I'm just going to say it in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to magically be able to fly a plane when I step into it with no training or no instruction, and somebody's going to actually be dumb enough to let me fly their plane. I can fly this plane in the name of Jesus. You took any classes? No. But I know Jesus no planes, and I know the Lord. Of the, yeah. I'm escorting you off of my property with a gun. You're an idiot. All things work together for the good. Not alone. Together. So for the past year, I've been studying. Studying. Sound. Processing. Mixing. Mastering. Song structure outside of the music and the instruments. The things that you don't pay attention to in a song, but you feel them and need them. Same thing in a movie. I didn't realize, I didn't think about it, that every song, commercial, TV show is like 90% to 85% music that we don't even pay attention to because we don't even hear it. We're watching the scene. But there's all this music in there. I'm just listening. The commercials I hear is the ones that when I recognize music, all I do is win, win, win. Ah, right, see, there's, there's a record. But there's other stuff that's happening in all these commercials that you ain't even hearing. Wow. So now I've been listening sonically for the past however long, paying attention to how that's cleverly placed. There's, there's things happening when people's walking in and closing a door that's music. You don't even know it's music in the movie, but it is. You just think it's a sound. It is. Vroom. Doors don't make that sound when they close, but you think they do when you watch a movie. 
Somebody stops, and you hear these things. And I'm like, wow, there's music under that. I'm, I'm hearing, there's a soundtrack. I hear a string moving in this. Wow. This is serious stuff. So I've been studying that stuff. Because I just fell in love with sonics. Not just music, but sonics. Now I go forward to do what God told me to do. You listening to me? I go forward to do what God is telling me to do in the past couple of weeks. I'm talking about weeks now. And God has opened doors and led me directly into situations. Hear me out. I'm not saying God hooked me up and I'm doing five movies this week. That's, see, that's church folk. That's church folk. I said a prayer. Why didn't God open the doors for me? Okay, no, 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 no. But the opportunities to learn out how the system works have opened up. I'm getting to go to meet. I'm excited about the meeting I'm going to in New York. I don't like going to, to uh, what do they call these gatherings? What do these call these uh, networking events? I can't stand those things. But I understand that if this is what you want to do, you better learn to love them because this is your life from now on. <laughs> this is what you do. You go to networking. Okay. Well, so Lindsay f found something online and she said, you want to go to this? Yes. <laughs> yes. God said, you need to change your attitude. Yes. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Yes. And it wasn't just me changing my I literally submitted my attitude to the Lord. Like, get, change my, yes. Hallelujah, yes. Now I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. And I begin to understand something. Once again, a scripture that I've known all my life, faith without works is dead. What works do you bring? What I learned in these past couple of weeks was this. Don't go to the people and say, here's my music, put it in your movie. Don't work like that. How, what's their motivation to, to do that for you? Why should they care about you and your stuff, if it's good or not? You go to them and you say, what do you need for your movie? I think I can give you that. I've listened to your stuff and I know what you like. And I think I got stuff that will just work for you. And God woke me up as I was talking to this person and I said, it's what you taught me to do with the staffing firm. You don't go to staffing firm and just say, I got people, hired them. You say, what are you looking for? What position do you need filled to make your business better? Oh, I think I could find you those people. Give me a couple of days. And then we go and we look for candidates. And God said, the supervisors, they're your clients. Your songs are candidates. Not all of them fit the job. You got to pick specifically the right ones that fit them. And then when you give it to them and they say, I like it, but you know what? I want it instrumental and I want the, all the words out, but I just want that one last word of the chorus there. And they, say, and they said, this, it's not a big, it's not a crowded industry because most people can't do that. You got to call your engineer. You got to call your producer. You got to call your people say, okay, they want to change it. Can you change it? Well, you got to go back and book studio time and do it. I'm like, I can do that in five seconds. Click, 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 click. Hey, I, well, I'm on the phone with you. Here you go. Check your email. Just send that. And God said, but look what I made you learn for the past couple of years. Made you study and learn the art of sonics, how stuff, all that preparation, all the little fragments all coming together from, from, from my businesses. So you, you understand everything coming together, how to talk to people, how to relate to people, how to sit down and have a business meeting, stuff I didn't know before Secure. How to talk to investors. All of this stuff that I didn't know how to do. Understanding how shares worked and how people work investments and how, what, what people invest in and why. The biggest thing we learned about investors is you find a pain and speak to that pain and people write checks. That's the key. Going to people say, I got this beautiful thing. I think you should promote it. That's, that's, that don't, so everybody got a beautiful thing to promote. 
Rach, your situation right now is that you found a pain and you spoke to that pain and that's what got you where you are. You didn't go to say, I need a job, can you hire me? Yeah, so what? You said, I looked you up and I see what you need and I could give you that. I prayed and asked Jesus for the job and he gave it to somebody else. Well, maybe they asked Jesus too and, and Jesus liked them better than he liked you. No, we, <laughs> come on, let's keep it real here. You got, I, I think about this all the time. You got two teams made it to the Super Bowl. They both in the locker room playing, praying for God to let them win. Both all Christians. How does God pick which he can't say, okay, tie. Super Bowl's a tie. I love both of y'all. God got to do some choosing right here. Come on now. So I heard this statement and it spoke to my spirit. This is when um, George Foreman was going to fight Lavanna Holyfield. And George Foreman was in, up in his 40s, up there in his 40s, and Lavanna Holyfield was still in his prime. And they asked him a question. Do you think this is going to be an easy fight for you, they asked Evander, being that of his age? And Evander said something that stuck with me and never forgot. He said, I'm not going to underestimate that man. That man filled with the Holy Spirit just like me. This is going to be a matter of who wanted more. He said, we need, to, we need to resort to something here that go a little bit deeper than we both got the same Jesus. So <laughs> we're going to have to bring something else to this table. So, faith without works. What Jesus you bring into this? And then what works you bring in to back up to Jesus? Because if you really believe God called you to it, then the works you do ahead of time and the research and the stuff that makes you bring that certain edge and God opens that other door for you that everybody else can't get open, that you walk in the door, well, I walked in the room, I expected them to like me. Okay, so they liked you. You're in. Now open up your book. Show me what you got. Okay, I do like you, and you're a nice person. I like him a little less, but he got more stuff. Bye. Come on now. So that's why the scripture says things like, the hand of the diligent tend to plenty. I got Jesus. Okay, but do you have diligence? Do you have steadfastness, con conviction? Are you encouraged? Are you appointed you got it so I'm watching God because God made me make a confession at the beginning of this year and I don't share it with everybody the few people who know me close enough know what my confession is it's a big confession my God that's deep you want me to speak that out loud he said if you don't nobody gonna speak it for you and even if they did, what difference does it make? You don't speak it, it ain't going to manifest. So I began speaking it. Some of y'all know what it is. Well, that now forces me, you listening? Not to get spiritual and wait. Hallelujah, I just receive it. Hey, shamalama, lama, lama. No, 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 no. Now, I need to know everything there is that's required of me so that when God shows up with the answer, the worst thing in the world is for God to bring you somewhere for promotion and you're not ready to stay in that office. Some of you have had it, got that promotion and lost it. God showed you mercy just to show you. See, jerk, this is what I'm trying to tell you. You wanted that promotion, you got it, and then you can't even stay there. Why? Because you're irritating. You get on people's nerves. You don't ever shut your mouth. You, you, you always think you know every doggone thing. And so every time somebody's trying to talk, you got to give your two cents, and they wind up saying, you know what, we... Um, we we, we haven't cuts in budget. We're going to have to let you go. You and your Jesus. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm sure Jesus will get you another job. Well, they don't like me becoming a Christian. No, because you're an idiot. You're an idiot. There's nothing to Christianity. You're an idiot. So you go back home and you learn not to have an opinion about everything.
not to have to always act like you know so much, but come in and be humble. Keep your mouth shut. Listen, let people talk. Sometimes let people show their foolishness, but you don't need to say nothing. Just let them talk. You don't even need to correct them and tell them they don't know what they're talking about. Just go, hmm, ah, oh, hmm, is that so? Oh, well, God bless you. Because I've learned when God told me, help not ask for his interference, I ain't correct the people they ain't asked for correction. You, you know it all? That's good. Well, good for you. You know, my favorite line, so how's that working for you? It's good. It's working. Well, no, I'm not. Oh, well, maybe you might need to rethink that. God bless you. Have a good day. Especially Christians. They're the worst. They know everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. The Lord told me that. Mm -hmm. Aha. Yeah. Okay, so then where's the manifestation? Where's your fruit? If you know it, where's your fruit? I'm standing. You standing in what? You could be standing in poop. I don't know. Telling me you standing don't mean you standing. No courage, no appointment. What are you standing in? What are you really believing for? So I'm asking you today with the little bit of time I have left, there have been some very serious things that went forward in this message. The honorable stand. How do we stand? When we're standing, we're saying we believe in God. Well, you can't stand and believe God unless you heard from God. And then you can't stand and believe God unless you stand and doing exactly what God called you to do. A lot of Christians are opportunity seekers. And that may sound like a good thing, but it's not. They will throw their hand into anything that looks like an opportunity, be it anointed or not, because the, num the numbers attached to it look good. So you see these people, they're going to do this this week. Oh, I'm doing this. Uh, and now I'm doing the network marketing. Oh, now I'm doing this. Oh, now I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah, I just found out about a rocket ship. I'm going to do that. Oh, yeah. And it's like, okay, but what are you called to do? What are you here for? Okay, maybe I can't have this conversation with somebody who's not a believer, but I'm talking to a room full of believers. Like, what, what exactly are you put on this planet for? Do you even know? Let's start with that. Because God want to bless me. Okay, God want to bless everybody, by the way, even non-believers. So you ain't saying nothing saying that. Christ, God so loved the world that he gave his son. So you're not so exclusive. Okay, so what? What did God put you here for? Why are you called to do it? I wasn't going to share this today, but it's on my heart, so... God keeps bringing it up, so I'm going to say it. Me and my brother Mike had a conversation again. Happy birthday, bro. It was his birthday yesterday, if you didn't know that. And I called him up, and I said, I got to share something with you for your birthday. Something God shared with me this week. And I said, I think you need to hear it. And he said, yeah. And I shared with Jericho the night before. I said, I shared with you guys not too long ago. Some of you knew, so I share it. Well, I kept going to God saying, God, as a businessman, I know you got to have a why. What's my why? I need a why. I need to know a why. I need to have a why. God, show me my why. What is my purpose? What's my why? And God said to me, your why is because I called you to do it, because I said so. That's all the why you need, because I said this is what you do, and this is what you do well. That, that, that's your why. You don't need the world's why. You need my why. Yeah, you don't need that cliched why. Thank you, Mike. So I said, God, okay, I received that. But I, there was a yearning in me, like, God, I need a, I need a, I need a different why. I need, a, I, need a, I, need a, I need something more personal, if you don't mind. I need something more. See, nothing wrong with that. God, I need something personal between me and you. I know you called me. You called us all to greatness. But, and I received that, not discounting that, but I need something more personal between me and you. Anybody here at that place right now? I said, I need something, God. And God's presence came on me. And here's the words that came out of my mouth. My why for why I'm claiming to receive this year, this huge thing that you made me speak, is my apology. It's an apology. My why is an apology to God 
for squandering my gift and calling for all of these years and not going forward and receiving all the things that he's called me to. My why, this is years me saying, God, forgive me for not doing what the gifts you gave me for all of these years. My why is my gift to you. Whatever success you bring me, I don't care if I wind up at the Oscars winning whatever, my why is to say thank you for being patient with me and not letting me die and all my gifts go in the grave somewhere. My gift to God, my, this is my personal why. Lord, forgive me. This is my apology. This is my, my sacrificial offering to you. I don't care about the success, the money, the wealth, and all that stuff that comes with it. The opportunity to not die and not fulfill what you call me to be on this earth. 